Magic Without Fears Hermetic Podcast. I'm your host, Frater R.C. For more and exclusive episodes, visit magicwithoutfears.com. Thank you for your support. Magic Without Fears, Hermetic Podcast. I'm your host, Frater R.C. For more and exclusive episodes, visit magicwithoutfears.com. Thank you for your support. Alistair Crowley, Francois Rabelais, and the Herb of Thelema. <clears throat> Alistair Crowley is a well-known 19th to 20th century magician. Francois Rabelais was a 16th century monk, bachelor of medicine, uh, um, and... Uh, um, Remembered largely for his well-known work of satire, Gargantua and Pantacruel. What could these two in cannabis have in common? Possibly the most intriguing Renaissance figure involved with the history of cannabis was the 16th century monk and alchemist, Bachelor of Medicine, Francois Rabelais, who lived from 1494 to 1553. Rabelais is best known for his hilarious epic adventure, Gargantua and Pantacruel. A bold and body satirical tale of two giants, Gargantua and his son Pantagruel. The book is equal parts philosophy, sex and fart jokes, slapstick humor, along with outright heresy and a generous dash of arcane knowledge. His mockeries of so much that the church deemed holy led eminent critics to regard Rabelais as a papafugue. That's one who gives the finger to the pope. The 19th century literary critic Alphonse de Lamartine was less kind and saw Rabelais as a poisonous fetid mushroom born in the dunghill of the medieval cloister, the defrocked monk's pig who regaled himself in his dirty sty and loved to spatter his dregs on the face and manner and language of his age. During Rabelais' own lifetime, his books were condemned by the religious academics of the Sombord for their unorth- unorthodox philosophy and by the Roman Catholic Church for their mockery of their aspects of their faith. Gargantua and Pantagruel is a pertinent interest to this presentation for the book's well-known cryptic references to cannabis under the name Pantagruelian, as well as for its philosophical influence it had held on later occultists and cannabis experimenters, particularly Aleister Crowley. Rabelais' Gargantua and Pantagruel contain three chapters with ref- hidden references to cannabis under the name Pantagruelian. Hemp was already utilized in Europe at that time, and Rabelais' own father was a hemp farmer and a winemaker. Hashish was introduced by returning crusaders between the 11th and 13th centuries, although the precise source and various uses of cannabis during this period are a matter of historical conjecture. The crusader route may account for Rabelais' familiarity with the various properties of cannabis fictionalized as the plant Pantagruelian. Rabelais, the physician, appears to have recognized the only recently reported analgesic and antibacterial qualities of cannabis. However, Rabelais, the alchemist, recognized much more in this plant. And it is also worth noting that the monumental Rabelais Encyclopedia, with good reasoning, refers to the herb Pantagruelian as, quote, mood-enhancing hashish, cannabis sativa, and the philosopher's stone, end quote. See my own Libra 420, which was dedicated to Rabelais, for a more complete understanding of the role of Rabelais and the identification of Pantagruelian and its connection to alchemy, which cannot be understated, with references to cannabis occurring in the works of the alchemists, such as Zosimos, who lived from the 3rd to 4th century, Avicenna, who lived from the the 9th to 10th century, and Paracelsus, who lived from the uh, 15th to 16th century. Alistair Crowley, who lived from 1875 to 1947, was a British poet, mountain climber, as well as a magician who incorporated cannabis and other drugs into his magical work. 
mostly for his association with magic, Crowley has continued to rise in popularity decades after his lifetime. To quote his, his student Israel Regarde, some of his finest writing deals with penetrating analyses of ether and hashish as aids to meditation and as chemical devices to catapult the psyche headlong into the mystical experience. He contended, among other things, that if the neophyte could taste the glory of the ineffability of his goals by means of an introductory dose of hashish, he would then be willing to embark upon a lifelong program of self-discipline to make the divine intrinsic part of his being. In 1904, Crowley claimed to have received a channeled work, the Book of the Law, from an entity known as Awas. The Book of the Law signaled the dawning of a new age, the Aeon of Horus, which followed the preceding Aeons of Isis and Osiris, which, by the way, were the names of the first two lodges of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which Crowley had formerly been a member of before leaving to form his own group and publishing some of the Order's secret teachings in a well-known scandal. It has been established that Crowley began his experimentation with drugs under the tutelage of the Golden Dawn magicians Alan Bennett and George Cecil Jones. Other prominent members are known to have written about and used cannabis and other drugs for magic as well, such as Golden Dawn co-founder Wynne Westcott and the poet and magician William Butler Yeats. Pivotal to the Book of the Law is the term Thelema, which Crowley felt summarized his philosophy and law of Thelema, do what thou wilt. However, centuries prior, in Rabelais' Gargantuan Pantagruel, there was an abbey of Thelema, and the motto, do what thou wilt, hung over the entrance of the abbey. To quote Rabelais, do what thou wilt, because men that are free, well-born, well-bred, and conversant in honest companies have naturally an instinct and spur that prompteth them unto virtuous actions and withdraws them from vice, which is called honor. Those same men, when by base subjection and constraint, they are brought under and kept down, turn aside from that noble disposition by which they formerly were inclined to virtue to shake off and break that bond of servitude wherein they are so tyrannously enslaved, for it is agreeable with the nature of man to long after things forbidden and to desire what is denied to us. Some have seen this as calling into question Crowley's reception of the Book of the Law. As a member of the Order Templi Orientis, Bill Heydrich has noted in the 1995 Thelemic Lodge calendar of this situation, in his article on the connections between Crowley and Rabelais, quote, it's widely known that Rabelais said, do what thou wilt, used Thelema, and employed an abbey of Thelema in his gargantuan pantagruel, four centuries before Liber Al, the Book of the Law. The old Hellfire Club continued that tradition through variations into the 18th century. For some, this becomes a question of cruelly faking it. For others, it is more of a matter of observing a gradual development of Thelema through a half a millennium preceding the Aeon of Horus. In any event, Crowley was equipped to hear the word when Awas communicated, end quote. Crowley himself acknowledged Rabelais' influence on this in an incomplete and unpublished in his lifetime essay, The Antecedents of Thelema, that he wrote in 1926. It has been remarked by some critics of the law of Thelema that the words do what thou wilt are not original with the master Therian, or rather with Iwas, who uttered to the scribe Ankh, F. and Consu, the priest of the princes, the book of the law. This is true enough. In its own way, we have firstly the word of St. Augustine, love and do what thou wilt. This is, however, as the context shows, by no means what is meant by the book of the law. St. Augustine's thesis is that if the heart be full of love, one cannot go wrong. It is, so to say, a rider upon the theorem of St. Paul's 13th chapter of the first epistle to the Corinthians, Far more important is the word of Rabelais, fais ce que veux, do what thou wilt. The sublime doctor does indeed intend, so far as he goes, to set forth in essence the law of Thelema, very much as it is understood by the master theory on himself. The implications of the context are significant. Our master makes the foundation of the Abbey of Thelema the quite definite climax in his history of Gargantua, he ascribes his ideal of society, thus was certainly occupied with the idea of a new aeon. And he saw, albeit perhaps dimly, that face of Cuve was the required magical formula. Crowley felt that Rabelais' work not only foreshadowed the coming of the Book of the Law, 
and the dawning of the Aeon of Horus, he believed the Renaissance French, French author even predicted his own arrival as his prophet. Crowley asked himself if Rabelais was, quote, aware of the prophetic fire of his immortal book, end quote, in predicting his own book of the law, and then answers his own question, quote, he has fortunately left us in no doubt upon this point. He indicates the master Therion by name. The very last verse of his oracle runs thus. Oh, read, read, read. How praiseworthy be he, who shall have persevered even unto the end. He who is able to endure unto the end, he insists, is to be blessed with worship. And what is this? I will endure unto the end, but Perdurabo, the magical motto at his first initiation of the Master Therion? Perdurabo is Latin for I will endure to the end, and this is one of Crowley's magical titles. Another way that Rabelais in influenced Crowley was the use of cannabis. Crowley used an anagram, Alcofrabius Nassie, to open an esoteric on, essay on hashish, the Herbal Sanctissimo Aribaco, the most holy grass of the Arabs, that he wrote in 1918 for Liber Elif, and which he would reprint in his classic book on the tarot, The Book of Thoth, which Crowley composed in 1944. Crowley ends Liber Elif and proceeds De Herbal Sanctissimo Aribaco in The Book of Thoth with the statement, I cry aloud my word, as it was given unto man by my, mine uncle, Uncle Fabius Nassie, the oracle of the bottle of that book, and this word is trink. Uncle Fabius Nassie is a well-known anagram for Francois Rabelais that Rabelais himself used at times to avoid persecution for his heretical writings. The bottle of that book was the source of the grail-like quest parried in Pantagruel, and trink is what the, was written on the bottle which served as an oracle for those who drank from it. In Rabelais, in The Secrets of Pantagruel, Henry Props Biraban compares the language used by the priestess of that book. The noble pontiff of the divine bottle to that of the adepts and in the invitation trink coming from the divine bottle, she invites indeed Panurge and his companions to partake to the path of divine knowledge, as did all the philosophers and wise men of antiquity. The outcome of the symbolic voyages and trial which they accomplish in the unground temple isn't of materialistic wine drinking, but of spiritual wine, which the Sufis talk of. In this regard, it should be noted that the hashish-infused wines was a well-known combination in the esoteric circles of the Islamic world. Krobst Birabin went on to suggest that the secret language used in Rabelais' work indicated a lineage with Christian hermeticists, the Templars, the Operating Companions, the Rose Cross, and the Spiritual Alchemists. Another important word from Rabelais is Pantagruelian. Appearing at the end of the third book is Pantagruelian. It represents the wisdom of the sage Pantagruel and symbolizes the quest for self-knowledge. The chapter dedicated to the description of Pantagruel Grulian, give the tradition of Renaissance writers an, an encyclopedic sketch of botany and herbal lore. Rabelais carefully develops the external characteristics of the herb through a detailed description of its various parts and size. He tells how and when it should be prepared. He then enumerates the several methods known for naming plants in antiquity. For example, some were named for their discoverer as mercurial for mercury. Others retain the names of their native regions and still others designate the power and effects they have. Then turning again to Pantagruelian, Rabelais shows that these ancient methods of naming plants are precedents for giving it the name Pantagruel. The Pantagruelian is a sim symbolic manifestation of Pantagruel, not in external appearance, but in its intrinsic virtue. It not only has a great medicinal value, but as hemp from which rope is made, it also serves as a means to the navigational discovery of new lands and knowledge. An agent for milling bread, it provides a source of spiritual food. In reference to pa Pantagruelian's identification with hemp, Arthur Chappelle noted in 1924, quote, since a store of hemp was necessary for a long voyage, the meaning is simple and clear. Nevertheless, the close association with Pantagruel, the explanation that all civilized arts were derived from Pantagruelian's miraculous powers, and the striking allusion to burnings, seemed to foreshadow quite another meaning, one deliberately abstruse and important, end quote. The discussion of Pantagruelian and its manifold uses comes about when Friar John, Panurge, and others joined the giant Pantagruel on an ocean quest. The quest itself was inspired by the fears of Pantagruel's cherished companion, the rogue and clown Panurge, 
who was gravely concerned that he might be made a cuckold if he marries, and he wishes to seek out an answer from the oracle of the holy bottle that was located in far-off India. In the list of provisions for the voyage is a store of both raw and confected Pantacrulean, the favored herb of the said giant. This is all in tune with the grail myth and Arthur being outlanced by Lancelot. As the, Rabelais encyclopedia, as, as the Rabelais Encyclopedia has noted of this event, as the companions prepare to the sea and visit the oracle of the holy bottle, Pantagruel takes on board a large supply of a mysterious product called Pantagruelian, which the narrator describes as a textile plant with numerous manufactured applications, clothes, rope, sails, etc., at the same time, Pantagruelian takes on many other forms, including mood-enhancing hashish, cannabis sativa, and the philosopher's stone. More enigmatically, its many virtues are supposed to bring humans together and make them conquer the universe. In Rabelais' Pantagruelian and Utopia, written in 2009 by Stuart Pelto, he noted this event also makes the philosophy of the Abbey of Thelema nomadic, creating a sort of traveling, temporary, autonomous zone, through which the message of Thelema can spread. Rabelais weaves an illicit thread of intoxication through the fabric of his praise for its industrial applications, even as he plainly raises his appreciation for canvas sales to a utopian level. Rabelais discreetly instructs his fellow citizens in the science of cannabis, its botanical identification, how to ignite the flowers, a likely side effect, and above all, the wine-like nature of the intoxication. He surreptitiously spreads his message of cannabis intoxication through the art of steganography, extending the intoxicating utopia of Thalem to all those who will take a cannabis intoxication trip of the Thalemage. Stuart Pelto makes an important point in noting that the same, the name of the lead ship of the fleet, Thalemage, is a development of the term Thalema. And through this, Rabelais transforms his vision of human happiness from a wine-based abbey into a cannabis-based fleet of ships. Further, the celebration of intoxication associated with the Abbey of Thelema is indicated by each sail of the fleet of ships being emblazoned with the image of some sort of drinking vessel. Quote, all the ships that set sail are decorated with symbols of a drunkenness in the form of a herald device. A bottle, a goblet, a pitcher, amphora, a wooden jug, a glass, a cup, a vase, a wine basket, and a wine barrel. Rabelais describes each ship's device in detail, end quote. As Stuart Pelta has noted, these, quote, heraldic devices are placed onto the sails of cannabis. The ships of cannabis are designed to expand the wine-inspired message of the Abbey to a global scale, end quote. Thus, with the Abbey of Thelema now rendered mobile, Rabelais is free to extend his model of peaceful intoxication. Further indicating the use of Pantagruelian above and beyond the industrial and even medicinal qualities of cannabis, Rabelais has Pantagruel, the giant of his tale, who shared his name with a said herb, load confected Pantagruelian among with a dried green herbage for a voyage. Amongst other things, it was observed how he caused to be fraught and loaded with an herb of his called Pantagruelian, not only of the green and raw sort of it, but of the confected also, and of that which was notably well befitted for present use after the fashion of conserves. As one 19th century author noted, this, quote, Pantagruelian herb so greenish and crude that when confected and prepared was to be none other than hashish, end quote. Rabelais refers to confected Pantagruelian, that is, it is, quote, be fitted for present use after the fashion of conserves, end quote. Conserves are made with dried fruit and nuts and are cooked. They have a very thick and chunky textures. And conserves made with Pantagruelian, of course, bring to mind forementioned medieval and mid-eastern delicacies like Dawa Mesk, the Islamic confection made with hashish, honey, and pistachios, and the Moroccan majun made with honey, ginger, nuts, raisins, and other spices, as well as Turkish delight, which was often prepared with hashish. Ingesting cannabis in such preparations was the normal means of using it, as the influence of the pipe smoking via tobacco had not taken hold as a means of cannabis ingestion yet. Considering the influx of Islamic literature and products of the time, it seems likely there was an awareness of such preparations among the more occult-minded of Europe. Stuart Pelto suggests Rabelais would have been familiar with confected forms of hashish through its mention in the popular medieval manuscript attributed to Al-Hassan al-Wazan, 
a Muslim figure who was captured by a Christian pirate and given as a gift to Pope Leo X. Prior to both Rabelais and the account of Al-Wazam, there were other Arabic-influenced references that have been widely recognized as identifying hashish in European literature, such as the Decameron, written in 1353. As well, Rabelais also briefly mentions Marco Polo, who lived from 1254 to 1324, and thus indicates a familiarity with the tale of the old man of the mountain and the obvious association that brings up with hashish, and thus revealing more evidence of his knowledge of the Arabic world. As well, Rabelais refers to the originally Arabic text, the Picatrix, which contains its own references to hashish incense. Rabelais rejected alchemical seekers of material gold, but embraced pagyric alchemy, and even identified his use of herbal infusions in alcoholic preparations. Rabelais also made a curious reference to both a herbal alchemical infusion known as a quintessence and the Holy Grail, which is parried in the story of Gargantuan Pantagruel. In a letter to a friend telling his companion who will be coming for a visit, uh, uh, he states that there is a, quote, good wine which is being saved here for your coming, like a holy grail and a second true quintessence, end quote. Rabelais in a letter to Antoine Hulot from March 1st, 1542. The reference to the true quintessence, a term used in Pantagruel, again brings to mind alchemical formulas and the various quintessences and arcanums that were prepared with cannabis and other substances in this time period. These were alcoholic infusions of different herbs which increased their potency. Rabelais also gives himself the his title, the abstractor of the quintessence in Pantagruel. Clearly, Clearly, there was a lot of experimentation at this time in regards to herbs for infusion into the medieval alchemical elixir. That Rabelais could have infused cannabis in such preparations due to his title extractor of the quintessence seems quite likely. Rabelais would have been aware of such preparations such as Cardano's cannabis-infused aqua ardennes. M.A. Screech makes a convincing case that Rabelais drew heavily upon Cardano's work in his composition of the third book of Pantagruel in his essay, Girolamo Cardano da Sapienta and the Tears Livre de Pantagruel. After a convincing comparison of the parallels of the two texts, Screech notes that, quote, Cardano was not an obscure author. Anyone who read him would have recognized the general area of leanings that Rabelais' comedy was acting upon, end quote. Cardano as well has entries that have been identified as description of hashish, descriptions of hashish by translators. References to the quintessence and cannabis also appear in the works of Raymond Law, who lived from 1232 to 1315, who Rabelais was familiar with, who, like Agrippa, he poked fun at in Gargantua's letters to his son Pantagruel, referring to him under the name R. Lullius. Clearly, Rabelais was familiar with the alchemical art of tincturing and making quintessences, it is the title of the extractor of the quintessence that best identifies Rabelais' potential use of a cannabis-infused elixir. And like a cannabis-infused arcanum, he infused his own work with cannabis by hiding it in there as the mythical herb Pantagruelian. As Rabelais describes his beloved cannabis, veiled from the profane as Pantagruelian. In this Pantagruelian have I found so much efficacy and energy, so much completeness and excellency, so much exquisiteness and rarity, and so many admirable effects and operations of a transcendent nature, that if the worth and virtue thereof had been known, when those trees by the relation of the prophet made election of the wooden king to rule and govern over them, it without all doubt would have carried away from all the rest the plurality of votes and suffrages." Crowley would certainly have also been aware of the association of the herb Pantagruelian with cannabis via Richard Burton's A Plain and Literal Translation of the Arabian's Night's Entertainments, written in 1885, which he read as a student at Cambridge. Undoubtedly, he would have noted Burton's comments identifying Pantagruelian with hashish, as well as his brief but educated overview on the drug's history. As well, Crowley was known to have acquired and read many classics in this period of his life, and it is in the same time period that he would have first read the works of Rabelais. To quote Burton, Hashish al-Harafish, rascal's grass, i.e. the herb Pantagruelian, various preparations of the drug are sold at an especial bazaar in Cairo. See the powder of marvelous virtue in Boccaccio 3.8 and 4.10 of these intoxicants properly so termed, I shall have something to say in a future page. 
The use of bong doubtless dates from the dawn of civilization. The Persians adopted the drink as an ecstatic, and about our 13th century Egypt, which began the practice, introduced a number of preparations to be noticed in the course of the nights. In the Confessions of Alistair Crowley, an autohagiography, the Rabelais enthusiast Crowley wrote, quote, the final secret is in the bottle inscribed drink, end quote. In Crowley's view, Amagus's philosophy could be summarized in a single word. For him and his love, do as thou wilt, it was Thelema. And Crowley is here suggesting that for Rabelais, the summary was in the word trink. In his 1923 diary notes for an essay on Rabelais that was never published, Crowley recorded, quote, Pantagruelian equals elixir or stone. Trink equals ecstasy conferring omnipotence, end quote. It is likely he saw this substance as something related to hashish. Crowley also made the following interesting comments to Norman Mudd in 1925, quote, Pantagruelian, necessity for the Abbey of Thelema. Pantagruelian is the material basis of the magical energies, the substance into which you can put any magical energy you desire, and it will cause the desired result to appear in matter, end quote. It seemed clear that Crowley connected this with cannabis. Crowley also refers to Rabelais' holy bottle from which the word trink came from in reference to his own use of drugs for divination. Uh, using, it, using ether, he, he wrote, such is the omen I bring back from the oracle of the bottle, end quote. A 1939 poem dedicated to the artist Bob Chan, Chanier, Chanier, published in Temperance, makes Crowley's reverence in regards to Rabelais and the ceremonial use of, use of drugs crystal clear. Trink. Alcofribus Nasir, oh, let us bathe and crown our hair and drink untempered wine. Let ever greater cups ensnare our souls in traps divine. Soon calms the season of love's rage, and joy grows short of breath. Birth shoots a shaft weighed down by age that strikes the target death. Then come, thou golden goblet brimmed with lust, though all be vain, there's hope for us, the lion limbed, in hashish and cocaine. Though death should hail us by the scruff of neck to smoldy portal, tonight let us get drunk enough to know we are immortal. I would suggest that the term lion limbed is a reference to Pantagruelian as the body has five limbs, Penta, and the golden goblet here in allusion to the grail parodied in the story of Pantagruel as the holy bottle. The poem starts off with a reference to Alcofrabius Nassier, which, as noted earlier, is an anagram for Francois Rabelais. And as noted in the Book of Thoth, Crowley opened this piece on hashish, the herbal sanctissimo Aribico, with this anagram for Francois Rabelais and this same word, trink. The opening of this paragraph, this esoteric essay on the herb, gives some indications of Crowley's own knowledge of cannabis in the first paragraph of the piece. Recall, O my son, the fable of the Hebrews, which they brought from the city Babylon, how Nebuchadnezzar, the great king, being afflicted in spirit, did depart from among men for seven years' space, eating grass, as doth an ox. Now this ox is the letter Aleph, and is that Atu of Thoth, whose number is zero and whose name is Ma'at, truth or Maut, the vulture, the all-mother, being an image of Our Lady Nuit, but also it is called the fool, who is Parsifal, Dereinator, and so refereth to him that walketh in the way of the Tao. He is in unity with his own secret nature. Here in a few brief words, Crowley gives us a taste of his knowledge and beliefs about his beloved hymn. Notably, Crowley refers to the Egyptian goddess Mott, whose devotees were reputed to have partaken of a sacramental drink the liquor of Mott, that was comparable to the Hindu Soma and the Persian counterpart, Haoma. Mott, as noted, was an image of Nuit, the Egyptian goddess of the sky, and she is profiled in the first of the three chapters of Crowley's Book of the Law, where we read, quote, If under the night stars in the desert thou presently burnest mine incense before me, invoking me with a pure heart and the serpent flame therein, thou shalt come to lie a little in my bosom, end quote. We can be sure this is a reference to cannabis, as Crowley saw the Egyptian incense of the pharaohs, Kaifi, as a preparation of hashish and made it clear this was instrumental in performing magic. As well, Crowley begins the essay with a reference to the biblical indications of hemp used by the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar in the eating of grass. 
As we now know, the cannabis was used in Near Eastern sacred rites, in which all kings took part of. And more recently, archaeological investigations have confirmed the use of cannabis in an 8th century BC Jerusalem temple, just out of Arad, Jerusalem. Uh, in the spring here, we read about uh, um, cannabis incenses burned in a temple in Arad to invoke the Holy Spirit of God. This is a very powerful information and something I myself have been uh, suggesting for 25 years based on etymological research. The beast further sees the, the biblical analogy to the ox in the story as being a Kabbalistic reference to the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, which is in fact symbolic of an ox and whose number is zero. A number cruelly recreated with a fool card. It is <coughs> under this card's designation that the herbal sanctis, sanctissimo eribico appears under in the Book of Thoth. In some Masonic lodges, this card is given to the new initiate starting on the path. Crowley further relates that cannabis initiates a Parsifal, the hero, who restores the grail, a story which Pantagruel and the quest for the holy bottle directly parodies, which also plays an important symbolic role for the OTO, as can be seen to the references of the story in the Gnostic Mass, an influence largely attributed to Wagner's opera Parsifal, which, according to one of the most well-known uh, Wagner uh, biographers, was being traded under the inspiration of an Indian hemp extract given to Wagner by Schopenhauer. And I've got an article on that. If you search Wagner, hashish, and the OTO, uh, you'll find that article. In this regard, it's important to remember that Theodore Roos, who founded the OTO, was a performer in Parsifal and had known Wagner since his youth. Besides the references in regards to the holy bottle, Rabelais used the term trink again, or rather the related French word trink, which is used as a toast in the discourse of the drinkers. And the passage really does seem to emphasize the lineage of certain esoteric groups and again throws light on Rabelais' own use of this term. It's been more than a year since the pandemic turned healthcare upside down. I'm Jody Lesh. Join me for Ahead in Health, where we explore the questions that matter most about the future of healthcare. Listen to Ahead in Health wherever you get your podcasts. A beautiful lawn is a beautiful thing, but it can be a lot of hard work. This Memorial Day weekend, check out John Deere at Lowe's. Choose a John Deere zero-turn mower, and you can cover a lot of ground fast and get around trees with ease. Or if you've got more on your to-do list, check out a John Deere lawn tractor. Add separate attachments so you can mulch, haul, bag, plow, and more. Shop in-store or at Lowe's.com. Lowe's, home to the best part of summer, U.S. only. And now... A word from our sponsors. While we cannot control whether any ads get put in the spots allocated, we thank you for listening to those that do since they help keep this project alive. You can also get ad-free content and bonus content and videos and a private webpage by subscribing exclusively to magicwithoutfears.com for only a couple dollars a week or six dollars a month or fifty for the year. It helps a lot, plus you get emails about other exclusive things. Thank you very much. I drink no more than a sponge. I drink like a Templar knight. And I, Tanquum Sponsus, bridegroom, and I, Sicut Terra Sine Aqua, like a land without water, pour out all in the name of Lucifer. Fill here you, and fill and fill peace gods on you, till it be full. My tongue peels. L'en trink. To thee, countrymen, I drink to thee, good fellow comrade, to thee, lusty, lively, halala, that was drunk to some purpose and bravely gulped over, O oh, lacrima Christi, it is of the best grape, the faith, pure Greek, Greek, O oh, the fine white wine, upon my conscience it is a kind of taffetas wine, hin hin, it is of one ear, well wrought, and of good wool, courage, comrade, up thy heart, Billy. We will not be bested out at this bout, for I have got one trick, ex hoc in hoc. There is no enchantment nor charm here. Every one of you hath seen it. My apprenticeship is out. I am a free man at this trade. I am prester mast, prestre mace, maestre passe, prish brum, I should say master pass. Oh, the drinkers, those that are a dry, oh, poor thirsty souls. Good page, my friend. Fill me here some, and crown the wine, I pray thee, like a cardinal, natura abhorat vacuum. 
Would you say that I could fly this drink? This is after the fashion of Switzerland. Clear off, neat, supernaculum. Come, therefore, blades, to this divine liquor and celestial juice. Swill it over heartily and spare not. It is a decoction of nectar and ambrosia. In this revealing passage, Rabelais makes a direct reference to the Templar Knights. And the idea that this order was somehow a group of brunkers does not seem to fit with what we know about them historically. However, it is intriguing to, in relation to what we have seen about infused wines and claims that the Templars had an infused preparation known as the Elixir of Jerusalem, a title for a cannabis infusion that would fit the sort of divine liquor and celestial juice Rabelais referred to. Now, I looked extensively to find, you know, this, this, there's these references to the Elixir of Jerusalem appear in numbers of books, uh, um, mostly books on aloe. And the, the recipe was an infusion of hemp aloe into a palm wine. And I, I found these references all over, uh, but only up to about 1990. So I can't guarantee there was no Elixir of Jerusalem. However, when I went back to documents from the Templars' trying periods and records from their arrest, I found that cannabis appeared on a list of seized items from two of the church's raids and arrests of the Templars, and the Templars had Saracens growing cannabis for them under contract in Spain. So they're clearly using it, and they clearly had large amounts of it in both France and England uh, when they were raided. In Crowley's 1923 diary notes, he records, quote, Pantagruin, elixir of stone, trink, ecstasy conferring omnipotence, like his own philosophy is do thou, as thou will, could be summed up with the word lima. Crowley is expressing that Rabelais' Secrets of Pantagruelian could be summed up in the term trink. The final secret is in the bottle inscribed trink, as Crowley wrote. In correspondence with a 32nd degree Masonic brother, P.D. Newman, author of Alchemically Stoned, who has also written about psychoactive elixirs in Masonic related rites, I asked him about Rabelais' statement, my apprenticeship is out, I am a free man at this trade, I am a prester mass, prester mes, maester pass, frisch broom, I should say master pass. Newman responded, quote, as indicated in Samuel Pritchard's masonry dissected, 1730, entered apprentice is the term which one was, was once used by the fraternity to designate the first degree of Freemasonry, entered apprentice. Past master, on the other hand, describes one who has in the past acted in the capacity of a master of a large or worshipful master, end quote. The reference to free man here as well may refer to Rabelais as a non-working mason in a working Masonic, Masonic lodge, as up until the 17th century, when masonry made the transition from operative to speculative, non-masonry workers were not allowed into the order. We know that cannabis-infused wines were known in French Masonic circles by this time through the 13th century Masonic lodge book of Villard de Honecar who, like the Templars, spent time in the Holy Land, and he returned with a book full, not only of new insights into the building arts of masonry, but with a full-page recipe uh, for cannabis-infused wines. Besides discussing the cannabis reference, Lieber 420 takes a deep look at the many Masonic associations that have been claimed for Rabelais' work. Clearly, Rabelais played a major role in Crowley's occult philosophy. In Lieber 15, the Gnostic Math, written in 1915, Rabelais is depicted as a saint, and in the Beast classic, Magic and Theory and Practice, uh, written in 1913, he wrote, he wrote, quote, the works of Francois Rabelais, invaluable for wisdom, end quote. As with his chosen word, Thelema, and its law, do as thou wilt, clearly, Crowley saw cannabis as a continuation of the practices and philosophies of the 16th century monk Francois Rabelais. Moreover, as I've discussed in Libra 420, both knowledge of Rabelais in this context and the use of psychoactive sacraments by certain Masonic related groups preceded Crowley himself. Moreover, there is evidence that this had been in practice for some centuries, dating back to Rabelais and further. That cannabis was used as an initiatory substance in such context by Crowley is clear, as Crowley ended the Herbal Sanctissimo Rebico with a comment that, quote, a man must first be an initiate and establish in our law before he may use this method, end quote. Comments indicating he knew more than he was letting on in writing about it. And this is echoed from his 1909 essay, Psychology of Hashish, quote, 
In order to keep the paper within limits, he wrote, it would be necessary to keep the article to a scientific nature and use information that was already quite available to the public at large, lest the austerity of such a goddess be profaned by the least prestige of an adornment, end quote. Crowley is likely here referring to codes of initiation, one of the occult organizations to which he belonged. And this, again, is also apparent by the veiled nature of his text, De Herbo Sanctissima Aribico. As well, this comment indicates Crowley's belief stated earlier that drugs alone will not enable the devotee to reach the mystical goal, but it also takes vigorous psychological preparation and study are needed. As discussed in Libra 420, Cannabis Magical Herbs of the Occult, we can be near certain that in the 19th century, some forms of Rose Croix, Memphis Miserium, and Scottish Rite branches of Freemasonry, which were claimed to have descended from the rites of the Templar Knights centuries earlier, there was drunk or partaken of in certain rituals under various names, such as the Bitter Cup, and it seems likely, at least in some forms, this contained drugs. In reference to the Rose Croix degree of Scottish Rites, Charles Nicolaud recorded in his 1913 work, Les Initiations dans la Société Secrétesse, Les Initiations Masonique, quote, the Rose and Crux degrees to the ordinary master mason degree is what a man who is intoxicated on hashish must be to the vulgar drinker who has recreated himself only with the red blood of the vine, end quote. A statement he borrowed from Jules de Donnell, the founder of Eclise Gnostique and an important figure in the 19th century occult world. Although Donnell later rejected masonry and joined the church during the era of the taxi hoax, he was at one time a keen associate of Pappas and other figures of the French occult scene. In regards to the hashish he identifies an association with Rose Croix degrees, he himself wrote, One feels proud and triumphant to be knight of the Rosicrucian. A kind of unexpected prestige surrounds the new title. The degree becomes dear and precious. There is in these capitular meetings a bad and intense joy which one never experiences in the big blue boxes. One is distinguished from others, selected, chosen, elected, and set apart. One experiences a kind of minute veneration for the rank. We understand the importance of this same grade that gives us in law, if not in fact, an enormous superiority over the masters. Strangely enough, all psychological work is done in the transformed self. The Rose Croix is at the ordinary mason what the man who has a drunkenness of hashish must be the vulgar drinker who has only been rediscovered with the red blood of the vine. There is also the proud joy of desecration, sacrilege designed, if not depth, of the association of the thinking man to the thought of the king of angels guilty of identification with him, of participation in his science, of communion with his word. There is also the influence of his spiritual presence. I firmly believe by an often made experience that Lucifer lectures to chapter meetings, rarely a manifest presence. John Yarker was an English Freemason who was a big influence on Crowley on the OTO and who became the grand hierophant of the Memphis Miserum in 1902. In an 1885 letter to fellow Mason Francis George Irwin displaying the letterhead, Agent and Primitive Rites of Masonry, he wrote the following glowing account of his mystical experience he had received under the influences of cannabis. My dear brother, brought me from India some ganja, what the Turks call eska and the Syrians hashish. Smoked in a cigarette as I used it, the Indians call it bang. It put me into a peculiar dreaming state, and I felt myself at one with the infinite mind, and whatever subject I thought of passed from the particular to the general. If I thought upon the relation existing between man and woman, I beheld myself a portion of the masculine energy of nature. When I thought of any particular subject, it seemed to become one with the universal mind. And I felt that at that instant I was one with all the rest of creation that was thinking the same idea. I thought of the origin of evil. I saw bubbles propelled from the one great source coming into accidental collision or as departed entities becoming antagonistic. So it was the vegetable and mineral creations, the essence of these seemed to spring from the one eternal source. It is quite impossible to describe in writing the extraordinary nature of this state, but I mentioned it to a student of the occult who has resided in India, and he told me that a yoga had 
told him that he used it for the purpose of obtaining union with the infinite, and that whilst taking it, he willed the purpose that he desired. Now, it's interesting, Crowley himself first achieved the state of samadhi, that oneness with the universe, according to his own diary notes, uh, under the influence of hashish, and he makes reference to the same state of consciousness in his essay, The Herbal Sanctissima Arivaco, in regards to hashish. And in fact, many of the figures recorded as historical influences on the OTO can also be connected with cannabis, such as Dr. Pascal Beverly Randolph, who, according to uh, Patrick Devaney in his wonderful uh, biography of uh, Pascal Beverly Randolph, Dr. Pa Pascal Beverly Randolph, a Rosicrucian sex magician, uh, a black Rosicrucian sex magician, he, he, he claims that uh, Randolph was, in fact, the biggest importer of hashish uh, into the United States during the Civil War era. And the Brotherhood of Luxor, which uh, uh, grew out of uh, Randolph's teachings, uh, they offered uh, mail-order initiations with a product that they claimed was Soma, which in fact was hashish. Pappas himself included uh, uh, many uh, references to hashish in his journal of Le Initiation, as well as writing about himself, and I've already discussed the influence of Wagner and Schopenhauer and their Indian hemp uh, extract. So it is clear that this sort of ritual use of drugs did not originate with Crowley. The French occult scene was particularly infused with hashish. And as noted in Libra 420, at least 12 edition of the Martinus Masonic Journal, the initiation of which the Pappas was the director of, as just mentioned, contained articles on the use of hashish. And this included references to Rabelais and Pantagruelian in this context. Moreover, in chapter 15 of Energized Enthusiasm, Crowley describes such initiatory use as does, does the secret rituals of the OTO in relation to the Masonic bitter cup. So it is clear that there were entheogenic initiations in place and indications are there, there had been such for centuries prior if one looks deep enough into the matter. The term Salima and do as thou wilt in the Book of the Law may even be indications that Pantagruelian was at play in the ecstasy of Trink when Crowley composed it, and, and in which would be fitting, as Crowley himself claimed, Alco Fabius Nassier had predicted both book and prophet. As the Book of the Law itself records, quote, I am the snake that giveth knowledge and delight and bright glory and stir the hearts of men with drunkenness. To worship me, Take wine and strange drugs whereof I will tell my prophet, and be drunk thereof. The idea that such divine intoxication may have inspired the Book of the Law cannot go without question. As Crowley himself noted in his 1909 scientific essay on hashish, preceding the entheogenic theories of the origins of religion by R. Gordon Wasson, Terence McKenna, Carl Rock, myself and others by more than half a century, the beast went so far as to speculate that, quote, this ceremonial intoxication constitutes the supreme rituals of all religions, ends quote. Crowley's philosophy, as do as thou wilt, was summarized in Thelema, a motto and word borrowed from the alchemist monk Rabelais, whom the beast says summarized his own philosophy of cannabis and tooth entheogenic inspirations in the single word, trink. And that's my presentation for today. Thanks for listening to Chris Bennett and myself, Fred R.C. at Crowley Mass 2020. For more information about Chris Bennett, you can find him on Facebook and also go to Lieber420.com. His book, Lieber420, is available on Amazon and other sources, as well as collector's editions direct from him of Sex, Drugs, and Violence in the Bible, Cannabis and the Soma Solution, available wherever books are sold, and finally, there is his out-of-print work, Green, Gold, and the Tree of Life, which if you find a copy, keep it precious, for it cannot be reprinted. And to all our Thelemic friends out there, 93, love is the law. Welcome to my friend's Erotic Stories podcast, where we listen to the best erotica from our friends online. Relax as you spice up your day-to-day -day lives. With a little bit of naughtiness, search for My Friend's Erotic Stories on Apple Podcast, Spotify, Google Podcast, and more. Also visit us on our slash erotic podcast and help us make our podcast better.